Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I'm your host. If you're new to the show, um, the whole idea behind this is to really celebrate people's lives while they're very much alive and well and kicking. Um, the idea behind the show came from my reading obituaries of some amazing people who I wish I had gotten to know why they were alive. So um, I put this TV show together so that, in fact, you can meet some amazing people while they're alive. Um, everyone has a story to tell. Whether you're the CEO of a large company or you're, you know, maybe you're a barber in some little shop, um, everyone has a story to tell. And I look forward to being able to air some of these stories so that others can appreciate the lives that we've all lived. If you would like to be interviewed on the show, send me an email at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Um, or if you know someone who might uh, be interested, please forward that email. If you have a question for the person that I'm interviewing, send me an email. I'll make sure that it gets to that guest and um, we'll get some information back to you. Today, I'm honored to have as our special guest, Richard Chapman. Hello, Richard. Welcome. Hi, Gary. Great to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me. So, um, Let's start talking about this wonderful life you've led. And I'm going to just hand it over to you to start wherever you'd like. Well, that's a wonderful life. <laughs> I, I actually uh, do feel like I have had a, uh, uh, a very fortunate life. Um, you know, and uh, as we were talking about before, it seems like there are some uh, uh, major chapters and the uh, the link between those chapters may not always be quite clear, but um, I grew up in uh, New Rochelle, New York, uh, home of the Dick Van Dyke Show, uh, just around the corner from Bonnie Meadow Lane, where it was supposedly filmed, but not really. And um, uh, in a uh, suburban New York community that was uh, very typical post-World War II, my sister, my mother, my father, and I, a uh, very kind of typical family, uh, 50s family life. And um, I stayed in New Rochelle until I was 18 and graduated from high school, at which point I went to uh, Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., I went to school at George Washington University. And mm -hmm. we, um, uh, I, I, uh, uh, kind of floundered there for quite a while, not really knowing uh, what I wanted to do. Um, met some great people, talented people, um, people that I really enjoyed getting to know and still are friends with many. Um, and it was only at the end of undergraduate school that I, I met somebody who um, thought I would enjoy working with his wife at the uh, MacArthur Boulevard Child Development Center. And I went there and I worked in the preschool there with um, children with uh, significant disabilities. And I, I just, something clicked, something clicked. It just felt like uh, something I was, uh, I really enjoyed doing. Um, I, I felt I, uh, I had a, a talent for, but uh, I had no idea what I was doing. Hmm. So um, this gentleman by the name of uh, Perry Botwin, Dr. Botwin, who was the uh, Dean of the College of Education at George Washington said, you know, if you want, um, you know, switch your major, put in the, the, uh, the proper uh, coursework, graduate from undergraduate, and I will find a place for you in um, our graduate school program, uh, which hmm. we're just beginning in early childhood special education. And so I did that. And when I, uh, in graduate school, there were 50 women and two men in the program. So it was wow. obviously early childhood special ed is not a, a male dominated field. So mm. my father, who really wanted me to follow his footsteps into banking or be a doctor or a lawyer, when I, I told him that um, I had decided to become a, a preschool teacher, um, you can imagine how proud he was of me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a, sh a shock to the system. 
<laughs> anyway, I uh, I met a woman there who was my uh, supervisor by the name of uh, Dr. Santis, Linda Santis. And um, uh, she and I to this day are still in touch. Um, wow. and, you know, she's one of those people that you meet and she changes the trajectory of your life. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I work so hard uh, in part because I was motivated by the material and the subject and wanted to become a, a, a skilled professional to help children with disabilities, um, but also because I, 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 I didn't want to disappoint her. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, I really kind of found my grounding uh, in part because of how she motivated me, but also because of my interest in the um, um, in uh, the work in the field, yeah. and uh, felt that yeah. it was just a incredibly a perfect way for me to address my values of wanting to give back to the community to others. Um, you know, yeah. I was a child of the '60s, and uh, and uh, this was a great opportunity for me to do a type of work that was going to meet those those uh, yeah. needs based on my values. And so really, I did. I yeah, uh, it, I, it, I taught. Yeah, it crystallized a lot of those values that were inside there, but it sounds like they just all congealed together around this this major this population of children and the people in the field that you met. Exactly, exactly. And it was, um, you know, it's kind of the perfect fit, you know, it, it just, it felt right. And mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing because I was not a great student my first two, three years in college. Um, but from that point on, I was a 4.0 student, you know, it, it was all about yeah. finding what was of interest, finding what was meaningful to you, and then yeah. uh, being motivated to uh, right. to do well and uh, and it and it felt easy it felt right mm -hmm. uh, the fit was right so i um i did that i uh, it was a uh, it was a new field early childhood special education and um, i worked for a while in the dc public system i worked for a while in the fairfax county virginia public system and then I had a deposit down on a house in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, which is was a small place back then. Mm. And at the very last minute, I decided to withdraw my deposit, get in a car and drive to Vermont mm. um, for an interview that I had gotten lined up uh, for another early childhood special ed job. And um and just decided to uh, to move to Vermont. You know, wow. very spur of the moment. Um, over the course of the summer, I decided to change course, and I got this position to start from scratch a um, essential early education program in St. Albans. Hmm. And um, the Triple E programs are the special education preschool programs, um, and they they operate in public schools. They're public education. And they serve the, uh, the children with the, the greatest need um, uh, between the ages of birth and five. Hmm. And so I was, um, I had the uh, opportunity to start the Franklin County program from scratch. Wow. And wow. Um, so here I am four years into my field and I'm, I have this incredible opportunity, which uh, I did and I loved and, and um, and got to travel Franklin County um, from Richford to um, St. Albans and, uh, and meet all sorts of wonderful people. Mm. Um, from there, I went to Swanton as a special ed director and I spent 10 years in Swanton um, and was part of central office as a special ed director where we became the first school district in the United States to integrate all of its kids with disabilities into the same classroom they would have been placed in had they not had a disability. And we, um, we worked in conjunction with, um, uh, with the University of Vermont, the State Department, and, and others to create the model to support that kind of a system. 
uh, and it was called Project Homecoming. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was in our school, school district. Um, and that's when I got to work with the likes of John Burchard and, uh, and Wayne Fox and all the folks at the Center for Developmental Disabilities. And, mm -hmm. and we, we created something which got national momentum and became um, really a state-of-the-art uh, right. way of thinking about how to support people with disabilities. It was really, right. um, it, was, it was way out of the box at the time. Richard, was that from birth to 18? It was from uh, birth to eight, uh, birth to 21, actually. Birth to 21, uh, right. That, that's kids right. would have a right to an education, a that's public right. education if they had a disability until they were 21. Wow. Um, so, and our school district had elementary, middle, and high schools. So, we, yeah, we had the full range. Hmm. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to hire Mark Sustick to pick up the early ed piece and run that part for us. So he he did the same thing I was doing at the school age at the preschool level and created models for preschoolers with disabilities to be integrated into regular preschools and regular daycares and things of that nature. And um, that that was probably singularly the most important thing I ever did professionally mm -hmm. um, was to be a part of that. And it wouldn't have happened just anywhere. I happened to have lucked into a, a time and place that was ready for it. The, the, mm -hmm. the teachers, the other administrators, uh, you know, the, the State Department of Education was being run by Mark Hall at the time. That's you know, right. you, you had Gene Garvin as the, uh, you know, it, you just had these incredible people that were like-minded, very um, child-centered, and uh, yeah. and we were able to uh, to move the system. We were That's able to amazing. move the, the model to so that we weren't just placing kids in classrooms. We were actually giving them a higher quality of education in a regular education. And, and we think that by doing so, we also enhanced the quality of regular education. Exactly. Uh, melding the two. Um, all, the, all the kids without disabilities were learning and growing as well, having those, their classmates in there. And, and also all the resources that were being pumped <clears throat> in because of the kids with disabilities were being used for all the kids. So yeah. everybody benefited. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, I'm not sure that it would be as easy to do it today as it was back then, because there were people who were willing to think a little bit out of the box. The bureaucracy didn't get in the way. Um, I had a superintendent who would let me do anything as long as I didn't embarrass him. Uh, and, uh, right. and, um, you know, we had a central office that was just a team. That worked yeah. together, Jeff Benet, Bill Williams, John Robb. We were we were a great team, wow. and uh, and uh, we supported our teachers. Wow! Did and did other once you started to do that? Did other school districts from around the state or even the country come to you to see how you did it? Oh, absolutely! I mean, we had um, on a monthly basis we had one or two days that were visitation days, and we would entertain people from all over the country who were coming to see how we were doing it. And mm -hmm. we would do a whole program for them um, that laid it out in terms of um, what we had to do to uh, create the supports. And then we take them out to the schools and let them see it in action. And um, we had literally hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the country mm -hmm. for years coming mm -hmm. to Swanton and Highgate. Sheldon, frankly, unbelievable uh, to see what we were doing. Right. Um, and then I decided that it was it was time for a change. I did that for about 10 years and went to the University of Vermont, where I worked with Susan Hazazi, who was, wow. you know, one of the uh, monumental figures in education in our country um, wow. and uh, had a five year stint with her working on um, a study, a national study to look at how special education is implemented across the country uh, and why, uh, if we're all operating under the same federal policy, 
are some states so integrated and some states so segregated. Um, mm -hmm. And so I got to study, uh, academically study, um, that subject, which I had worked on in, at the ground level for 10 years as a special ed director. Um, so it was, it, was a fan, it was a great opportunity. We landed up writing a, uh, a research paper called the um, uh, a Policy Analysis of Least Restrictive Environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, had it, and that was published in um, in uh, Exceptional Children, the uh, Journal of Record for Special Education. Um, but I, I just found that that was, I mean, I got my doctorate. I was kind of in the higher ed mode. It just it didn't have the same feeling to me that I had when I worked in a public school. I felt yeah. I felt a little too far away from it all. Mm -hmm removed from the, the the action and the intimacy of the working with the kids and families yes and and the teachers and, and your and your partners yeah yeah it was it was it, it, something just it, and it wasn't my sweet spot you know it wasn't what mm -hmm. i was best at mm -hmm. um i was better at the ground level I mm -hmm. think. um and so i applied for the principalship at swanton thinking that well if you want to advocate for kids with disabilities the best way to do that is to be in regular education because that's where they're supposed to be. Sure. And so I became the principal of Swanton Elementary, which is the second largest elementary school in the state. There are about seven, when I was there, there were about 700 kids. Jeez. Uh, and that's Jeez. just K through six. Um, so that was a, for a first principalship, that was a big school. Um, but it had, just this incredibly talented staff of very dedicated teachers. And it, um, it was, it was a, uh, as good a school as I have ever been in, not because I was the principal, believe me. Um, it was when I got there. And mm -hmm. if anything, it was less when I left, <laughs> you know, but no, but it, it was, it was, it was just a um, nurturing, caring, uh, community of parents and teachers that felt like everybody belonged. Mm -hmm. And this is a community that about 20, 25% of the school was Abnaki. Um, so we had, you know, wow. a, 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 a interesting cultural mix. And yet yeah. at the same time, you had a school that was really cohesive and, and, um, I think the Abnaki community came to realize that the school was a very, very supportive of their children, um, and uh, didn't really uh, didn't really differentiate in terms yeah. of where you came from or who you were, or, mm -hmm. you know, what your heritage was. You know, Richard, I want to just stop you for a second because for the audience's sake. So you're doing this fully integrated um, school work with kids with special needs from zero to 21. You know, in 19, around 1998, I'm in Mississippi giving a speech to um, an audience of special educators and mental health folks. And the director of special ed for the state of Mississippi was speaking before me. She got up and said, my greatest achievement in all my years of being the director of special ed was to make sure 94142, which was the, the law that created special education, that all kids, no matter what level of disability, deserve free and appropriate education in their home community. She got up to say that we have kept that law out of our state. And that's my greatest achievement. So here you have this Swanton, Vermont, fully integrating all children, no matter what level of disability, in, in Vermont, and at the same time, you have a state in the southern part of our country that just kept the walls high and thick and no no entry for any kid with special needs. I just want the audience to appreciate what you've been able, you were able to do up there. Well, and when we did, when I worked with the University of Vermont and I got to travel with Susan and others around the country to, uh, you know, visit, um, every, every we had six states, and in each state we went to a highly integrated school system, a, a, a um, highly segregated school system, and then we do interviews at the state level. And 
it is, it, we're just trying to figure out why, why do you have the Mississippis and Vermonts? Because we're all operating under 94-142. You know, it just didn't make sense that if you have federal policy, how can there be such a broad interpretation? And it really came down to leadership. Um, unlike the effective schools research, which said, you know, leadership at the principal building level, we found it was really at the central office level. You know, when you had superintendents and special ed directors and people of that nature that were kind of driving the train um, and providing the resources and supporting the staff and and connecting with parents um, that uh, that you saw a very different outcome, you know, a much more integrated outcome. Um, so it was very fortunate to sort of like have the opportunity to step back and look at it what we were doing on a micro level to look at it on yeah. a macro level at the exactly. national level. Um, and so I, I did the, um, uh, I, I was a principal in Swanton for 10 years. And then I was a principal mm -hmm. in Waitsfield for my last five years. I thought I would just sort of kick back, go to a small school that had more resources. And um, it was interesting because it's, it wasn't easier. It wasn't more <laughs> relaxed. No, it was. And, Pretty, and the and idea of a principal, <laughs> the idea of a principal and kicking back doesn't fit. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. And the whole time, you know, I, Swanton was a better fit for me. I'm a, mm. I'm a Swanton kind of guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a much lower socioeconomic um, uh, profile to the town. Um, but what I found was that uh, even though there were a lot more social problems in Swanton from, you know, domestic abuse, child abuse, uh, drugs, violence, you uh, know, things uh, of that sort, yeah. um, it, was a, it was a very engaged community with their children. Mm -hmm. um, and they worked with the school more closely and they, um, they appreciated the school mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. deeply in Swan, I felt. Um, so then I retired in 2008, which it's hard to believe that that's now what? Um, 14 years. 14 ago. years ago. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's what's, what was funny for me was, you know, you, I had, I had accumulated four degrees, including my doctorate. I had, worked for 34 years in the field and then all of a sudden it stopped mm. you know and i stepped back and it, it turned out i got yanked back in for uh as an interim principal for a principal in moncton that got sick and wasn't able to continue uh, so i helped them out there for uh about a year after but basically i was retired yeah and then when i i stopped completely i I, 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 I switched gears 100%. Um, one of my passions from childhood has always been sailing. Um, I learned how to sail when I was like seven, eight years old. Hmm. And when I went to college, I, I pulled a sailboat down to DC on a trailer and parked it behind somebody's barn. You know, I just <laughs> have always had a sailboat. It might be a dinghy, it might be 10, 12, 13 feet but I always had a sailboat. And, um, and then when I retired, I, um, uh, my wife and I decided that she, she was gonna work for a couple more years, but that when she retired, we would, um, we would find ourselves a sailboat that we could live on and we'd mm. sell our house and, and um, you know, put all of our possessions that we kept in uh, storage and live on a boat and see what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we landed up buying this beautiful boat called Atalanta, uh, a 44 foot little harbor, which is wow. a, a, a Ted Hood designed, beautiful sailboat, um, older. It was about 25 years old when we bought it. And we did some work on it for a couple of years, got to know it. Um, gave a lot of thought to it. And then we moved on board in 2013, started sailing south. 
And my wife, who grew up on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota, wow. um, not she's not Native American, but her father worked for the tribe, um, the Lakotas, and um, uh, she spent most of her like third grade to twelfth grade on the reservation. Wow. Um, and believe it or not, um, uh, sailing is not a big sport out there. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, there's no water out there. <laughs> I don't think swimming is a big thing either. Because <laughs> she didn't know how to swim. So um, we move on board. And she says, I'll give you two years of this. You know, I, I, can, I can do this for two years. And uh, that was 2013. We came back 2020. Um, wow. And we we got down and we uh, that winter we left the country and went into the Bahamas and took what they call the thorny path, which is down to the Dominican Republic and across Puerto Rico and through the BVIs and the USVIs and into wow. the Caribbean chain, and then landed up for hurricane season in Grenada, which wow. is a problem. and. Um, spent we, we put the anchor down and we didn't pick it up for about four months and just became part of a community there that it was it was an incredible experience you know mm. we met all sorts of interesting people from all over the world uh, that had all sorts of incredible experiences and one night we're sitting there with our friends from england tony and ann and I think we had way too much to drink. And he looks at me and he kind of slurs out, you want to go to Suriname? And I looked at Kay and she looked at me and we both said, sure. You know, we, we didn't even really know where Suriname was. <laughs> I, don't <think. laughs> I don't know where Suriname is. The Suriname is, um, uh, is, is uh, if you go down to South America, around Venezuela, past, um, uh, British Guiana, then there's Suriname, then there's French Guiana and Brazil. So you're about 300 miles from Brazil when you're okay. in Suriname. It's the old Dutch Guiana. And um, we decided that we would do that. And so we sailed down to Trinidad and did our preparation, uh, made our arrangements, and then we sailed seven days. Hmm to Suriname, up the Suriname River, into the Amazon. Oh, and, my goodness. And we, we lived up there for two or three months. Um, and just, uh, it, you know, experienced living in the Amazon Basin. Uh, and it was this incredible experience. I um, can imagine. Just incredible. We had a, a car that we rented for $5 a day. And um, we traveled down to French Guiana and visited the uh, the prison that Papillon was in. Oh um, my gosh! We uh, uh, we took uh, dugout canoes with giant outboard motors up the Moroni River to a campsite up in uh, Maroon territory. Um, just you know, saw incredible things. The mm. the capital of Paramaribo is a uh, World Heritage Site. It's mm. a, a city completely built of wood. Um, wow. the, the, the cathedral in it is wood, uh, everything, you know, and this is the old Dutch Guiana, so uh, all the signs are in Dutch. Um, a lot of people speak Dutch there, um, you know, which is not any, not a language I, I know, so, right. but you know, we were able to communicate and um, uh, just had, I mean, it was an otherworldly experience. Um, you know, it was, it was great. What, it was great. What, it was, I mean, you've you already mentioned a few. I, what was the most exhilarating thing that you came across in that time there? I think, you know, it was, um, it was when we, we um, we got this guy who had a about a fifty foot dugout canoe with a about a hundred horsepower Yamaha on it, and we hired him to take us up the the Moroni River about yeah. four hours, and he could take this canoe up the rapids, up wow. the rapids, and wow. we went to this 
place where there was a campsite that um, belonged to a guy we met in Paramaribo. And we stayed there and we visited a maroon school that was up there. Mm. Hiked to these water, we hiked to a set of waterfalls where we had to get the permission of the tribal chief before we could go up there. Um, yeah. because they, they belong to the, uh, they were in his territory. Um, and just experiencing, you know, the deep jungle with all the wildlife and the, uh, the natural features of it and, and the people that we met up there. Um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, a lot of the people we met were, were native to that area. Um, but a lot of them were also, uh, Dutch, Dutch immigrants. Um, but the Maroon Indians were the original, um, they, they, they were escaped slaves from, um, from the, uh, the slave trade days. Wow. Um, and they went up into the jungle and they began a, uh, a very separate community up there. Wow. And they, was, uh, they there, made... was, was their language, um, African or was it totally Dutch or what, what? No, what their... um, the people we met, they, they had their own language. Um, uh, I'm sure it was based on their, their African um, roots, but um, I couldn't tell you, uh, I don't remember where, what part of Africa they were from, but I don't think it was the same as the language of their area. I think it had kind of over the years um, uh, morphed into its own unique yep. um Yep. language which was a combination of dutch and that um, african language but the uh communication with the native people there was a little bit um difficult just in that we were only the second american boat to ever go up the the uh the uh, Surinam river um it's it's not a tourist area uh, you know <laughs> no. there it, there's no infrastructure for you know for tourism wow. um you know wow. we had to uh, we had to travel to get fuel and cans and stuff like that um mm -hmm. but um it was it was a very very uh, it was a fascinating place and we we really enjoyed our time there wow. and then we sailed at, at, at a certain point my wife Kay said um i think if we don't turn around now and start heading back toward the north um we're never going to go back mm. and we were kind of committed on the the coast of south america and didn't really want to um go around the horn or anything like that um that would be a much bigger adventure than either of us were up for yeah. um, and so we turned around and we went back and then we went and explored the western caribbean and we ended up spending quite a bit of time in, in Guatemala um, and lived on the boat in Guatemala for probably a year and a half. Um, and we, we loved Guatemala. It was, uh, it was, it was beautiful. Um, the only problem there was it, you had to be very careful because it's a, um, it's not a safe country. Uh, so you had to, pick and choose where you went, and where you didn't go. Um, flying in and out of the country was difficult. Um, but we, uh, we did a lot of exploration in the mountains. Um, we uh, lived up in a town called, um, oh, what's his name? San Pedro, Atitlan. And, um, and uh, it was, it was, it's a beautiful, beautiful country. Richard, and, how did you support financially support yourself through all this? Was, was that your retirement from uh, your work? It, yeah, it, it it basically my goal was to, you know, I mean, we had saved money and invested it, and then because I was an educator, fortunately, I'm in one of those very few professions where there was a pension, right? Um, and then social security. So yep. those three sources of money generated enough income on a monthly basis to cover our expenses. So my goal was that when we get back from this whole adventure, 
that we will not have more money than we had when we left, but we won't have less. And right. it, it worked out. It worked out because <laughs> the biggest expense is maintaining the boat, you know, yeah. keeping the boat up. Um, but the actual day-to-day -day living expenses are pretty low in these places. Mm. Um, when we were in Guatemala, we were buying our food off of vendors that had their goods on a tarp on the sidewalk. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it was definitely um, more of a, uh, uh, a, a, I don't want to say third world, but it was kind of a third world economy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, the whole, the whole economics of it were different. Um, but then we went up, we went up and we um, fell in love with Mexico and wow. we lived in Mexico for quite a while. Um on an island called Isla Mujeres off of Cancun. And wow. we did a lot of exploration of the Yucatan Peninsula and the, um, the, uh, the Mayan ruins and wow. things of that sort. And um, we, we loved it there. Mm. Um, we, I, we, you know, I like to dive. Um, I like to fish. Um, it's, you know, it was just, and Mexico is, maybe one of the friendliest places I've ever been. Um, you know, it felt safe, it felt welcoming. Um, and it's, uh, you know, in my opinion, the food is just, Mexican food is just incredible. Good Mexican mm. food mm. is probably one of my favorite cuisines. And mm. food in the Caribbean is not good. Um, you know, it's it's just, there isn't there isn't a lot of good food to be had <laughs> in most of the places that we went so when we got to mexico and all of a sudden you know you've got this really evolved cuisine um mm. it's quite quite nice wow. <laughs> but um yeah we uh we lived in mexico then for uh on and off for quite a while and then uh found our way back to uh the United States sailed from Isla Mujeres back to uh, the Dry Tortugas off of Key West. Spent a little time there uh, visiting uh, uh, Fort Jefferson and and then found our way back up the coast. Wow. Um, wow. And ended it all in 2020. Wow. On but, that uh, same boat. We were on the same boat the whole time. Yeah. The whole time. Wow. Yeah. And then, uh, but about 2018 or so, Kay had said to me, um, I need a house. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we bought this house. <laughs> <laughs> Between you and me, it's kind of like a noose around my neck. But <laughs> After wandering through the world here. So, so we, uh, you know, now we're, um, we're snowbirds. So we, we love Vermont still. We, uh, we live here in the summers, in the spring, in the fall. And uh, we got a different boat. Uh, went over to the dark side, got a motorboat. And uh, in about a week and a half or so, we'll leave here and go to uh, um, live in Charleston for the winter where we have family. Hmm. And we'll get to visit with a grandchild and a, one of our sons. And, nice. Nice. And... Uh, and uh, live down there and then we'll bring the boat back up and we'll be in Vermont for the summer. So we use our boats in the winter, not in the summers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, right. so a little bit opposite what most people do. And, and you're doing, but you're also boating in the summer here too. Well, I'm a, I'm a ferry captain. And um, uh, one of the things I did before we went on the trip in 2013 was I got my captain's license and uh have done uh, picked up jobs here and there as a delivery captain and a ferry captain. I've driven the Ticonderoga ferry for a while, um, mm. but mostly oh. I, I drive the uh, the local motion bike ferry at the cut at um, in Colchester, uh, Colchester South Hero, and um, I've been doing that for about five or six years now, um, on and off when I was up here in the summers, and. Uh, the um the the bike ferry is is a great retirement gig you know the uh 
Locomotion is this organization which promotes bicycle tourism in Vermont and is involved in bicycle safety for schools. Um, they rent bicycles, they run the ferry, they do a lot of political work to try and get, um, you know, uh, rail trails built and to advocate for bicycle um, tourism. So they bring a lot of tour groups into the state. And um, the mm -hmm. bike ferry, um, two years ago, I think it was, it was the last time we counted before COVID, we counted how many people would transport like 35,000 people in a year. Really? Yeah, wow. it's hugely popular. And um, it's a great gig. You know, you, you go out there, you meet all these happy people in a beautiful place doing something that's recreational and fun. Yeah. And um, I, I really enjoy that. Wow. Uh, double back to that father who would like to have had you become a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> How did he resolve this with this son that not only uh, committed himself to special education, but also voting. Well, uh, the thing was, my dad had two recreational passions. One was sailing and one was skiing. Well, there you go. And he was one of these guys who worked. He commuted into New York City every day for 40 some odd years and went to work in a big building doing his banking thing. Yep. You know, he was very successful at it, but I don't know that he was particularly thrilled with that type of work. And um, his idea was to make enough money to be able to retire so that he could ski in Vermont and boat on Lake Champlain. Mm -hmm. And at the age of 26 or so, he looks at me and he says, now, wait a minute, you're 26. You've got a full-time job, you're skiing all the time, and you're sailing on Lake Champlain. What, what am I doing wrong here? <laughs> so I said, well, I just, I didn't, I didn't think it made sense to wait my whole life to do that, which brings me pleasure. You know? So um, I was able to find a balance in my life that, um, that he became, he, he grew to admire. Yeah. And. And he grew to admire the work that I did. That's you know, funny. he realized that what I was doing was important. And in fact, at the age of 70, he became a uh, ski instructor for people with disabilities. Wow. So, wow. you know, that was wow. really his nod to, uh, of acceptance to yes. what I had dedicated my work life to. Wow. Amazing. That's what a tribute to you and your dad. Yeah, huh. but I, I definitely feel as I look at his life and I look at my life that I I figured it out better. Yeah, than he you did. figured it out. <laughs> good, good thing. I didn't spend 40 years doing something I didn't really want to yeah. do so that I could do something else. <laughs> How about your sister? What did she end up doing? My sister is an interesting character. She, um, she was a... Uh, a uh, mother of three and um, you know spent most of her life raising her kids she worked as a, a um, uh, in the advertising uh, business for a while as a uh, executive secretary and then she worked for uh, some real estate um, firms um, again administrative kinds of jobs mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that she ever found her work to be, you know, more than a way to make a living, support her family, and uh, yeah, and and uh, you know, put a roof over the head for the kids. Yeah. So uh, you know, and now um, you know, she's she's a little bit older than me, um, so she's she's uh, you know, got a pretty quiet life, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, you know, we see each other periodically. Um, not that often, but uh, we, because um, we, we live a fair distance away from each other, but uh, you know, there's still a closeness there and a love yeah. for each other, but you yeah. know, we're not, uh, we're not, we don't have a daily life together. Yes. Uh, yeah. And your mother, um, I, we talked earlier and you're, she's reaching a hundred years old, but where did she fit into the kaleidoscope of 
Richard Chapman? Well, it's a, that's a good question. Um, she she's not reaching hundred. She is a hundred. She, she uh, is a hundred. Okay. She, she, she 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 passed that mark uh, in July. Wow. And so I keep trying to tell her, you know, you're really a hundred and one because <laughs> your birthday is celebrating the end of your hundred. <laughs> you're really in your hundred and first year. Um, <laughs> she hates it when I do that. Um, but um, she. Um, she 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 was a very um, quintessentially typical '50s stay-at-home mom, raising the kids. Um, and then when we grew up and moved out, um, she really didn't. Uh, she was of an age where she didn't really um, have a profession or a work life, so she ended up doing things that were more typically, you know, um, social with other friends her age, um, uh, belonged to a few organizations that did charitable work, things of that sort. But, you know, all in all, she's had, again, a pretty quiet life. And now that mm -hmm. she is over 100, she feels very, uh, she still lives in the same house that I grew up in. Okay. So, yeah. So when I go to visit her, which I will in a few days, um, I'm going back to the house I grew up in when I was wow. a two-year-old. It's a little creepy. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. It's a, that's, a, that's a lot of continuity. That's um, a lot of continuity. <laughs> so we, um, but, you know, her life has become very small because, you know, she, she can walk with a walker, but, you know, she's not that steady. Um, right. So she has to be careful um most of her friends are are gone yeah you know? very yeah. few of them if any are are still around so she right. you know uh, remarkably there is the children of one uh, next door of are the same as when i grew up they've taken mm -hmm. the parents house um but pretty much my mother lives a very uh isolated and quiet life she has a companion that helps her and yeah. um yeah. You know, it's, uh, I think she's doing very well for a woman her age, but she is 100. Yep. Wow. So you've had a... Part, part of the problem is also, you know, you end up with uh, losing your hearing, your eyesight starts to go, you know, she can't watch television, she can't read, you know. Hmm. Um, That's tough. You know, audio books are hard for her now, and, you know, so it's it's a... Uh, yeah. It gets very small. Yeah, I'm sure old. she'll be happy to see you in a couple of days. Oh yeah, she's looking forward to it. Yes. So Richard, we're uh, coming to the end of our time together, but is there, when you think about the the length and richness of your life, to is there anything that stands out? Recognitions, uh, personal achievements. Um, you know, well, how would you? How would you summarize this wonderful life of yours? Well, I think, you know, we, we touched on it a little bit when I talked to you earlier, but um, I think part of it's just a willingness to take chances, um, you know, to do things which are not familiar. Um, and, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes you have a great experience and sometimes you go, well, I won't be doing that again. <laughs> um, okay. but, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, just sort of recognizing that time changes us and time changes everything around us. And you've got to sort of, you know, not hold on to, you know, oh, the good old days. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, mm -hmm. the old days for me were pretty good. Um, but, I, but they're over and I'm looking forward to some different things in the yep. future. I don't know what they are. Um, yep. I'm not much of a planner. Um, you know, I, well, I do plan, but not that far in advance. <laughs> and, right. and, uh, you know, my, uh, my thought is that things will become evident. Um, things will open up if you, if you, if, if you're open to them. Yeah. So 
I'm yeah. looking forward to the next 10 years or so, but I also expect, you know, that I won't be doing the same kinds of things. I mean, I had a, a revelation the, this past winter. This past winter was the first winter I didn't have a boat. Um, and so I was up here for the winter. Mm. And um, I was in between boats. And so I got a ski pass. And I used to be like a a really good advanced double black diamond bump skier type guy. Which wow. is why my knees feel so good today. Uh, but uh, I got back out there and I realized that like, I can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't, I can't go down the same trails anymore. I have mm-hmm. to take it easy. I enjoyed it, but yep. I'm going to do it differently. Yep. Um, so, yep. I mean, there's a certain, I think, part of how the next 10, 15 years, if I'm lucky enough to have them, though, is going to be dependent on my willingness to accept the fact that, you know, there are new adventures out there and there are new experiences to be had, but I'm not the same person I was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. I can't do yeah. the same kinds of things. And yeah. so I don't want to dwell on that because I'm sure there are things that I can do that I couldn't do back then. That's right. And that's what yeah. I'm looking forward to. Yes, you've had, you know, lis- listening to you this last hour or so, you have had that an, almost an uncanny ability to say, to let go of even things you love doing to try something else. When you left Swanton to go to Waitsfield to be the principal there, uh, so other people might have just held on to that Swanton job and mm-hmm. called it a day or played it out even beyond when they, probably should have, but you have the ability to just keep moving on to the next adventure um, and then learn from that to inform the next place. And and, and one of the things that we haven't talked about um, is, you know, just my whole uh, relationship with my children. Um, and, uh, you know, my biology, my, the children that I had when you know, brought to the this Brady Bunch group that we have now. Um, Rachel is uh, 40 uh, years old this year, and Caitlin is 34. And they're both, uh, they both have their own successful, interesting lives, um, and are doing very well. But, you know, their, my relationship to them also has changed dramatically over the years Mm. when they were little they needed something different than what they need now um and uh while we were we all love each other and we're all very close to each other um the relationships are different and Mm -hmm. you know i i I struggle sometimes more with that than Mm -hmm. i do with some you know what i'm doing with my own life uh Mm -hmm. in terms Mm -hmm. of activity um because you know you you just cherish those uh the intimacy of raising a child you know it's Absolutely. just so you're so entwined with each yes. other and now you know it's that's, independent that's the ultimate letting go isn't it our children it is it is yeah. and, and letting go but not losing touch right exactly yeah exactly so i feel i feel fortunate Oh, good. Any any last words you'd like to share with the audience about your life? Um, words of advice. Well, you know, you had you had one question down here. It said, "Do you have any favorite quotes?" I think this would be a good way to end. Oh, no, um, that'd be wonderful. One, one of my favorite um, movies, or play, uh, actually, it was a play um, by Herb Gardner. 1964 play called uh, A Thousand Clowns. And uh, in the movie, it was played by uh, Jason Robarts. And he had this one line that stuck with me. And it was, uh, if life isn't fun, then it's just one long dental appointment. (laughs) (laughs) I try to remember that all the time. That's a good line. (laughs) Great line. Richard, thank you for being on the show and sharing your life with us. And, and um, it's a good life. Thank you. Fun to celebrate with you. Well, it's fun to reminisce and great to see you again. Same here.